not competing against your direct competition anymore. You're competing against every piece of content that's published. So you're competing against LeBron James, you're competing against Netflix, you're competing against Kevin Hart, Kim Kardashian, and all these people. So you need to find a way to just stand out. Wherever you still feel, that's where you've got to become the person that will attract over 200 different cognitive vibes. The real work in any business. Um, so the first question that we'd love to just kind of ask you is just, uh, we'd like to get to know uh, who you are more and have our viewers get to know who you are. So can you just share your story on just how you got to where you are today? Yeah, so I've been in the digital technology social space for over 15 years. And the way that I initially got into it is I went to film school because I wanted to produce movies. And going to film school, I really wanted to learn about business because if you're going to produce things, you've got to know the fundamentals of what it takes to run a, a business and, and scale one. And as soon as I got to film school, I realized they teach you nothing about business there. So I figured the best way to really learn about business is start your own. And the most cost efficient way at the time, and it still holds true today, is to start internet companies because uh, you can create them in hours and get them up and running without huge overhead or locations and things of that nature. So I started those uh, internet companies while I was going to college, really just to learn and experiment, just to understand what does it take to get something up and running? What are the fundamentals of it and, and all of that? It was less about how do I make a ton of money or become rich off of it and more just from a, an experience standpoint. And then when I moved to LA to pursue a career in film back in 2005, I showed up and quickly realized because I started at the bottom like everybody else making coffee and copies and deliveries, that you needed to find a unique way to stand out. And saying that I was a wannabe film producer was not the best way to do that because there was tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people moving to LA every year to pursue that same way. So as, as we really break down in the hook point book, I needed to find my hook point. I needed to find my way to stand out. So like anything else I do, I take a step back and I start listening and just listening to what people are saying around the office, what trying to figure out what are their pain points, what are their challenges. And I noticed that as soon as we finished a movie where we invested tens of millions, in some cases, hundreds of millions of dollars, and there's a sense of anxiety that comes over the office and, and the producers and the fact that you've spent all this money to build this amazing asset, but now you've got to make sure that enough people show up opening weekend to justify that investment that you made. And typically in these movies, uh, there is no brand. Nobody knows about it unless you, you're doing the, with the marvels of the world, which you know, those are few and far between in the film industry. You, you've essentially got to build a brand from scratch. So a brand that people know about, hundreds of millions of people need to know about over the course of the a few months around the world. So with that, I just started to you know, just say, hey, listen, we can look at social media. It was it was new, like MySpace was, was kind of the predominant player at the time. YouTube was just coming on the scene. Facebook wasn't really there yet. It was obviously launched at that point. But I just said, well, why don't we look at these platforms and these social channels and these, and there wasn't a term for it at the time, but influencers and how we can tap into that uh, to promote our movies effectively and get it to the masses. And, and that really resonated with you know directors, producers, studio executives, and that was my hook and my way in. And I went from making coffee and copies to starting a, a digital division for the first studio I worked for. And then over the course of a few years, I just realized that I was more set out for being an entrepreneur and that the film industry wasn't as, in, as creative as I hoped. People think it's this really sexy thing, but it's another corporation. Uh, and I don't blame that. I mean, it's in there to be a business, but I just found myself spending more time asking for permission to do things than actually doing things, which is not really the way that I like to operate. So I left and I started building technology platforms and licensing them back to big media companies. So that's where I license platforms to like MTV and Viacom and Vice and Paramount and, you know, uh, a bunch of other of these big media conglomerates. Mm. And then from there, I just kept you know, staying down this road of, of technology, digital and social and the larger applications of it, of syndicating people's messages around the world in the most effective and cost-efficient ways. 
Wow, that's amazing. And your success is just phenomenal, dude. And I, um, and with that being said, I'm just curious, what, what's one of your favorite um, accomplishments in your journey? Well, I think that, I think there's two answers to that. My favorite accompl accomplishment is what we've collectively done as a team with the first book in terms of building a, a sustainable engine to really promote and market books at scale because I just know that the more books we put in people's hands, the more positive impact we can have in the world. Mm, we absolutely. spent a considerable amount of time, energy, and effort and resources to build that and to learn that. Uh, so I'm really proud of, of our team uh, for really figuring that out. And then I would say that the most rewarding experience was the work uh, that we did with Taylor Swift because there were some really key learning lessons around that mm -hmm. because most people don't realize that she's the reason for her success. She didn't have a huge record label. Mm -hmm. She didn't have millions of dollars of marketing budgets. It was, it was her sheer brilliance that has made her the global superstar today. And that brilliance really stemmed from the fact that she understood the value and the importance of a fan base and not just to cultivate fans, but to turn those fans into brand advocates. And she is a master at doing that because she realizes that fostering one-to-one -one connections with the fans in the form of responding to comments, signing autographs, taking photos with fans, not only turns that fan into somebody that's going to buy her music and uh, merchandise and all that, but they turn into brand advocates willing to share her message with the world. And because we live in a social media age, when we're sharing things, uh, whether it's our favorite music, television, shoes, whatever it may be, you're no longer just sharing it with three to five of your closest friends that you have physical interaction with. Mm -hmm. You're now sharing it uh, with people that can post to their social media, reaching hundreds, thousands, in some cases, tens of thousands of people. And that's what Taylor really understood. And uh, she even took it to another level because we worked with her very early on. But as she started to scale, obviously, fostering that one-to-one -one connection with fans wasn't scalable. She couldn't mm reach every single one uh, individually, no matter how bad she wanted to do it. So that's where she took it to the next level of showing up at bridal showers, showing up at weddings, showing up on uh, Christmas with gifts uh, to fans' houses, having a sleepover for the top fans to do an album listening party. And she recognized that doing those things and turning that into content would express to the larger fan base that she couldn't connect with one-to-one -one that she cared. She cared about them. Even though they weren't the one getting the gift, they weren't the one uh, where Taylor's showing up at the bridal shower, they felt that connection. They felt that care almost as if Taylor was doing it for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. That's that, is, that is fantastic. That is such a unique uh, way to look and how to connect with people. Because a lot of people look at the algorithm for all these different social medias and you see it dropping and people wonder how can you still engage? How can you still reach these people despite the algorithm dropping? And that is a fantastic answer being that when you show one person you care, that can get spread and that can go across all of your platforms and all the rest of your audience. So I appreciate that. Um, so I'll kind of want to take this and transition into your book, uh, Hook Point. Uh, a question that I had while I was reading it is when you're creating a hook point, how do you balance learning? Um, how do you balance learning what works and creating um, your own version? Yeah, well, let's let's first start by just defining a hook point for for those of those the people that haven't read the book. So they're familiar. Yes, yeah. So a hook point at its highest level is is grabbing attention. And why is attention so important? Uh, because Today, there's over 60 billion messages sent out on digital platforms each day between social media posts, push notifications, emails, text messages. We're inundated with content. We're inundated with information. So that makes it become criti critically important to stand out because the world that we're living in today, for better or worse, you're not competing against your direct competition anymore. You're competing against every piece of content that's published. So you're competing against LeBron James, you're competing against Netflix, you're competing against Kevin Hart, and Kim Kardashian, and all these people. So you need to find a way to just stand out. And a hook point is designed to do just that. And there's three core pillars to a hook point. It's first, 
getting people to stop and winning the first part of the conversation in that first three to five seconds. Because without that, you'll never get to your purpose. You'll never get to your brand. You'll never get to your product or service. People will just keep scrolling. Or if it's on the street, they'll keep walking by. So it's critically important to win the, those first three to five seconds so that you can get to the second core pillar, which is the story that you're going to tell. So first, you've got to win the attention. And then second, you have to maintain that attention with the story that you tell. And the story that you tell can get into your purpose, your why, your branding, your product, your service, the value that you offer into the world. Which leads into the third core pillar is, do people believe what you're saying? Do people trust mm -hmm. what you're yeah. saying? Does this come, come off credible? And all three mm -hmm. of those core pillars have to fall together successfully in order to grab and maximize attention. So again, without that hook, without the first three to five seconds, you never get to the story. If you grab that attention, and this is what, what happens with clickbait, if you grab that attention, but your story doesn't match up or your story is no good, then you lose that attention. Now, if you grab the attention, your story is good, but people don't believe it, then it falls flat as well. So that's really what we define as a hook point. Now, now to your, your question, Gabriel, is we, first off, we always study what's successful, but just as important, we study what is not successful, what falls flat. And most people forget to kind of look at both sides of the coin in, in terms of doing it. And then in terms of looking at what's successful, making a determination of, you know, when your research is done versus when you start creating, first off, your research is never done. We, we are constantly learning. Like me and my creative director are always sending each other ads and social content on WhatsApp, Slack, uh, Instagram. We're always looking at what the market is doing. So that process never mm -hmm. stops. But at the same time, you don't want to paralyze yourself of just in this endless research. You've got to put it into the action to see how much you're learning, to see how much uh, traction or progress that you're making in developing your, your own hook points. Wow, that's so good. And you know, I mean, you talked about these three pillars, which is just super vital to building this. <clears throat> With that being said, is there like maybe three different things that you could say that you notice that people do commonly very wrong in their marketing um, that maybe you would just encourage people to stop? It doesn't have to be three things, but just what are some things that you would encourage people to stop doing that you notice that's pretty yeah. common? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the first thing is they step, they, they skip that first core pillar. They go straight to their story. They go straight to trying to build trust and credibility without getting people to stop. And it, it there's a very nuanced difference of how you do it is we really treat that first three seconds as what is the pattern interruption? How do we just get the scroll to stop? How do we just, mm -hmm. yeah. how do we get somebody to stop on a busy street or to respond to a cold email or outreach or an ad or whatever that is? And that, could be as simple as like an effective meme card, the burning headline at the top, or it could be like a visual uh, that's on the screen. But so many people just jump straight into the story, straight into the sale, straight into the product or service, and ultimately it, it ends up falling flat. Uh, another big mistake that people make is saying the same thing in the same way as everybody else. So the analogy I like to talk about is like if we were going to launch a meditation app is meditation has been around for thousands of years. You type in meditation into Google, you'll get billions of results. So what would most people do is they're going to say the same thing as everybody else. Meditation is the key to success or meditation is the key to relieving stress and anxiety or contentment or happiness or whatever it is. The minute I see that, I already know what this video is going to say. I already know what this post is about. I'm just going to keep scrolling. Not to say that this person or this company may not offer unique value but again, in this attention economy that we live in, where there's 60 billion messages re released each day, we need to pick and choose where we spend our time. And the minute mm -hmm. somebody feels that they already know what is going to be expressed, then why do I need to stop? Why do I need to pay attention? Mm -hmm. So one of the tools that we use uh, for certain clients uh, in doing this is subverting expectations or flipping it on its head to create that initial pattern interruption uh, to get to the story. So with meditation, it may look something like uh, meditation is a scam is the headline. Interesting. And then, yeah. and then I'll, I'll dive into the story because I don't want to be, I'm not talking about clickbait here. 
It's got to dive into the story and then the story needs to be believable. So let's just imagine that the meme card, the burn in text at the top was meditation is a scam to create that pattern interruption. And then I come on the screen and I, and I say, have you ever felt like just meditation hasn't worked for you? Almost like it, it's almost a scam. Well, if that's you, I feel your pain because when I first started meditating, I was listening to these, these experts or reading these books telling me I needed to sit down and clear my head. But every time I sat down, my mind would race. And I didn't know if it was me doing something wrong or this thing called meditation was just one big entire scheme trying to trick me into joining a cult. But I'm here to tell you, I found a few techniques that I would love to share with you. These three key strategies that turned me into somebody as a non-believer, a non-meditator to somebody that now meditates every single day for the past 10 years. Will you please click the link below to join me on this journey? Wow. So yeah. what I'm doing is I'm creating that pattern interruption, but that pattern interruption is tying into the story that I tell. And then hopefully because I'm relating it to myself and I'm delivering it in a way that's a personal experience of me, it's connecting with those people that have failed to meditate and hopefully it builds enough trust and credibility that they're willing to take the next step or the next action item that we want on their journey of working with us. Wow. That's so good. And I was drawn in even with that example that you were giving. So that's so good. So good. Um, now, what about branding? Um, how important is branding to building your company? Well, I think branding is like phase two or phase three of your company. You've got okay. to first win attention because your brand doesn't mean anything if you don't capture those first three to five seconds. Yeah, and I think absolutely. people also try, and this was a, a mentor of mine that worked for for Live Nation very high up in Def Jam. And he said that, that people jump into building their brand too quick before they even have a business. Make sure wow. you have a business first. Make sure that you know how to sell. Make sure that you know how to get people to stop and pay attention. And then through that, you'll figure out what your brand is. But people oftentimes put the cart before the horse of defining the brand before they've really mastered the other elements of what truly makes a business successful. Fantastic. You're, I think you're absolutely right. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm not saying branding is not important or yeah. valuable. It's just, when is it important? When is mm. it valuable? And that's the key to Simon Sinek and his message is resonated around the world. Mm. There's immense yeah. value to it. But at the end of the day, nobody cares about your brand. If they're not yeah. even stopping and paying attention to mm. it, because they won't Can know what you're you about. Can we dive into this a little bit deeper too? Because I think this is really important for people to hear. Like when you talk about putting the cart before the horse with branding, because I think you're absolutely right. I think that when people start their business, they have the most beautiful fonts and pictures and all this stuff. And they're just pushing that stuff real hard. And it's like, they haven't even defined themselves yet. So can you kind of walk me through what that looks like to in the, de the definition process? Well, it's first, you've got to figure out what works. I mean, we see this all the time, especially with social content. People want to have like a consistent aesthetic style or theme or format before they even have figured out what works on social media. And then they get so stuck in matching their content to this, this theme or this branding or this style guide. And then they get stuck and it doesn't perform and then they can't figure out how to get it to perform because they keep doing the same thing over and over again. So really your first job in creating a business or, or, or taking your business to the next level is identifying what really works, what messaging, what hook points, mm -hmm. what calls to actions, what products, what services. And then when you have that, you have enough data to support that that direction works, not just saying you did it once, you made one post go viral or you made one sale, but if you've done it consistently, then you can start looking at it. Okay, now how do we better generate consistency around it? How do you better generate brand around it? And, and then that's where I would take that next step. Um, so we only got about two more questions for you. Um, this one we like to ask towards the end of all of our interviews. And it is, it's going to sound totally out in left field, and that's because it is. Um, if you just take a moment and imagine that you're on your deathbed, right? You're coming to the end of your life. You have those you love closest next to you. 
you have your friends, your family, what is the one piece of advice you want to leave them with? It's a great question. And there's a few things that come to mind. Let me see if I can kind of distill it down into one. Is it advice for themselves or advice that they it's would advice that you would want to like your last piece of advice that you would give those around you? It has it doesn't even have to be anything related to what we've been talking about. Well, I think that there's business advice. Yeah. And then there's personal yeah. advice. Do you want me to do both oh, or do just both, please, if you're willing? If, I think that oh, the do both business, if you're willing. I would love that. The business advice is really listen. That that's the biggest thing. Is like my success is only based on one thing is that I am listening and I'm listening intently to figure out what is it that this person need or these group of people need that I can offer the most value to them. And then, you know, from a personal perspective, you know, I, I think that really understanding and, you know, I'm learning this every day and I would say I'm not, I'm by no means a master at it, but, but getting, an appreciation for the short time that we have on this planet yeah, and, and making choices, you know, based upon that, that finite time that we have. And again, I'm not a master at this. I work on this, but I think oftentimes we get caught up in the decisions that we make on a daily basis based upon the fact that we feel like we have forever, or we feel like we have a, a long period of time mm on this planet, which is definitely not the case. Yeah. Right in <laughs> that so vein, then um, I'll, I'll go ahead and ask the, the final question is what are you most excited about in your future? Well, to me, it's, it's helping people stand out and grab attention is, is both of my books are dedicated to people around the world that have a very powerful message, product or service to share with the world. They're just struggling to find a way to, 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 to be heard, to, to get people to stop and pay attention to what they have to say. So I would say that's really my core fo focus and mission. And we work with new people every day that really are doing remarkable and amazing things. And it's just a matter of, of positioning and contextualizing it in such a way to help them take off, to help them go viral so that the most people can be impacted and, you know, hopefully lead us uh, into, you know, a better society and a better world. Wow. Dude, you are an amazing person. Can I just say that please? Like you just oh, are you. an absolutely it. amazing person. And I want to just encourage all of our viewers and listeners to just pick up your books. Um, we're going to leave your books in the link in the description below. Um, and dude, just please keep doing what you're doing. Uh, cause it's been super helpful for both Gabe and myself and many, many others that we've spoken with. And I just, I really appreciate your time coming on this podcast with us. It meant the world to us for sure. Yeah, thank you so much, man. Yeah. Thank you guys. It was a pleasure to connect with you. And again, connecting with everybody watching or listening to this.